Okay, greetings. This is class three of the DC Controls uh, sequence of classes, and this class is titled uh, Breaker Controls Class Number Two. Here, before we get started, I want to give you a safety tip. Today's safety tip is that when you visit a substation, to the extent possible, do not touch any things. Um, there's nothing really to be gained by you as a substation engineer or designer going and touching anything when you're conducting a site visit. Now, occasionally, when I'm uh, in substations, I'll actually put my hands in my pockets just to remind myself to not do that. Now, normally, I, I don't really like to, to, to put my hands in my pockets. It kind of looks unprofessional. But in the case of a substation, I'll make an exception. Because think about this. I'm in a substation. I put my hand up against, say, a steel structure out in the yard. What's the chances that there could be a stray voltage in that structure that is going to pass, cause current to pass through my body. It's not inconceivable, and there's no point in, uh, in uh, taking that chance. Also, when you go inside the control building, there's plenty of other reasons to not touch anything, because you actually occasionally will have some uh, exposed control wiring, you've got a battery in there, you've got all sorts of things, and there is no benefit to you whatsoever in touching anything. So, when you visit a substation, do not touch anything. In this class, uh, first off, I have to throw the reminder in that if you do not have the drawings uh, for this class, which is the same two as last week, you need to stop right now and go and get those. You should be available uh, from download on uh, PLC, or you can get them from your department manager. OK, in this class, we're going to continue our study of circuit breaker control. And uh, we're going to review last week's material, because it's very important. And then we're going to add a couple features to this, and these will be ANSI numbers 25 and 86. And these, uh, last week, everything we talked about was within uh, the control cabinet of the circuit breaker. And these are not there. They are located back in, uh, in the control building. So it's kind of important just for, for a physical frame of reference to keep that in mind where these are located. Um, we're going to take a, a couple minutes to revisit the charging uh, circuits and the heaters. And uh, jumping right into that, this is the same uh, schematic that we looked at last week. And just as a review, the area where my cursor is, is the closed circuit. Uh, and notice that it's got a supervisory leg. And all of those conditions have to be met before we're going to allow uh, the, the circuit breaker to be closed. And remember, that is not or logic. <clears throat> Um, we also talked about a concept last week on, on how uh, various breakers deal with low gas. And uh, in all cases, for low gas, they will block close. But the real difference comes in the trip circuit. And this particular drawing is shown to trip on low gas. If you were to take this contact out and replace it with a B contact from the same relay and put that in a supervisory position, right over here, getting rid of that jumper there, then you would have, that's how you would modify this uh, uh, to implement that logic. Okay, we talked about uh, the spring charging and how a circuit breaker, by its nature, has to have stored energy so that it can operate within the speed that we need the thing to operate. And keep in mind that um, there are going to be cases, and we'll get to this in a couple classes, where we're we want to reclose after a trip. So without charging, you know, having to recharge the spring, you should be able to trip, close, and trip at a bare minimum. Okay? And the uh, spring charging on this particular circuit breaker is located in this uh, uh, circuit right here. And then up in this area are some of the protection features that uh, supervise that motor and check the, uh, the, the health of that motor. Now then we talked about the, the 52B contacts and the difference between them and the 52A because in all breakers and in, in, in most uh, control schemes you need to know the status of the breaker, whether, whether the breaker is open or closed. Okay, and we also spent a fair amount of time on the anti-pumping circuit. I'm not going to go through it again today. It's this circuit here. And I really want you to take, in fact, it might, now might even be a good time to, uh, to pause uh, this uh, video and make sure that you understand 
how that, uh, that circuit works. And then finally we talked about the motor charging circuit and, and how all of that is uh, controlled with limit switch. All right, I'd like to introduce another concept to you, and this is a, really is just a small variation of what is, you know, what the, of the schemes that we talked about yesterday. And this is the uh, 52X scheme. And this isn't used too much anymore, but in, in old style circuit breakers, particularly oil breakers, you needed a really strong uh, solenoid to, for, to operate your trip coil within the time frame that you needed the, the thing to work. And that would draw a really large current, and with, associated with the large current would be a significant voltage drop. And so the problem that this causes in large switch yards, some of the distant breakers, and some of these, and sometimes you know, you're, you're thousands of feet away from your control building, so some of the breakers would, uh, would have trouble tripping and closing because of the voltage by the time you, know, you had run all that current through the, the uh, control cables to get to the breaker, the voltage was too low. And so um, another way to look at it is there's, with all that control cable, there's so much impedance, and in this case resistance, um, that it's not able to draw enough current to, uh, to make the, the breaker operate. And so the, the, the uh, solution to that is the 52X scheme. And there was a substation I actually did some work in uh, at one point where they even had two different control voltages. Now most of the, the control voltages we'll see these days are 125 volt DC. And, and that really is what's been in my mind the whole time I've been, been discussing these. However, it didn't necessarily have to be that. Um, you could have a control voltage, of, and this is what this substation did, of 48 volts within the control house, and then 250 volts for everything that goes out to uh, the equipment in the yard. And the idea would be that you would have, and how, how you would take advantage of this scheme, you would have a DC vo um, distribution voltage within the yard that actually operates the equipment, and it would be fed off of some very large cables, say a couple parallel uh, 500 KC mil coppers. And uh, so what you're doing is you're using the control scheme, and, and we'll look right over here, you'd use your normal control scheme not to energize the uh, closed coil, but to just energize a small auxiliary relay. Then that auxiliary relay is used to uh, cl actually close the circuit breaker, and it's connected to a different DC bus, and that DC bus would come off of the DC distribution that, that would be installed out in the switchyard. You probably won't see this very often, but if you do, uh, it, it's a good thing to, to at least understand. Again, it, it helps with uh, voltage drop issues, but one of the things to keep in mind is that it's going to affect how you implement your anti-pumping scheme, and so uh, again, as you look at that uh, circuit breaker schematic, you want to make sure that it all makes sense to you and that it all works as I have described in uh, both you know, in this class and in the previous class. All right, I'd like to change topics now, and I want to talk about the, uh, the 86 and the 25 uh, uh, relays. These are both things that, we, that at various times we will want to use to supervise closing because we may want them to prevent us um, to allow that circuit breaker to close. Now, <clears throat> again, as I mentioned in the introduction, these are located in the control room. They're not actually at the, uh, at the control, break, uh, control cabinet of the circuit breaker. Um, the 86 is a lockout relay, and I described it in the first class. And again, the idea is it's kind of like an auxiliary relay, except when you trip it, it will stay in the trip position until it is reset by a human being, and the idea is there's a handle there. You actually have to turn the handle to get it back into the reset position. Now 25 is a sync check, and I'll spend a little bit of time here 
uh, introducing you to the sync check relay. And again, both of these can be reasons to not close a circuit breaker. Okay, I'd like to spend a few minutes and introduce you to the concept of the sync check relay. And basically, in the case of a sync check relay, what you have is inputs to the relay of the uh, voltage on either side of an open circuit breaker. Now, if both are hot, what it's doing is it's looking at the phase angle difference between the two. And you're going to define what you're going to call one of them bus and one of them line. And you generally will use your bus voltage as your reference voltage. And then on the line voltage, you're just seeing how far, um, you know, uh, how many degrees away from the bus voltage you are when you're trying to close the breaker. And generally, you do not want to close a breaker if it is more than about 30 degree uh, phase angle difference. Any more than that, and it can cause uh, stability problems in your system, and it can actually even uh, damage uh, spinning generation. Now you also have the condition that uh, one side of your breaker will be hot and the other side will be dead. And obviously, uh, you'll generally want to be able to close the breaker uh, for this condition. And again, we, we refer to that as either hotline dead bus or deadline hot bus. Now then, here's a uh, couple of interesting twists. And you know, as the saying goes, the devil's in the details. Transitions between the different states can have, can, uh, if not done properly, can defeat your anti-pumping scheme. And uh, let me show you what I mean by that. Okay, I've taken the drawing that we had from uh, last week, and, and you've got a hard copy on it. And what I've done is uh, I've shown a closed contact, right, or our closed circuit, right up here. And that's where our, con our uh, control switch is. And then we're going down to the closed circuit in the breaker. But before that, I'm putting B contacts from our 86 lockout relay and from our sync check relay uh, in series with that. So when I close this control switch, if there's been a lockout, then that's going to prevent this breaker from closing. Similarly, if we have not met synchronous conditions, we're also going to leave that, uh, have that uh, uh, not allow us to close. Okay, what happens in a sync check relay is really your, your bus voltage is considered your reference, and then your uh, line uh, voltage, you know, the phase angle on it, you're, you're, you're looking at that, and if you're within about a 30 degree window, you're allowed to close. Now, in some substations, particularly those associated with generation, not only do you have a sync check relay, you may actually have a, a, a sync meter. And it will look kind of like what I've drawn here, where again, your bus voltage is considered your reference. And then this will be a little, uh, almost like a clock, you know, an arm on a clock. And it will move around depending on what your generation voltage is, or in the case of a substation, it would be what your line voltage is. And so where I've drawn it right here is at about 45 degrees. And at that stage, it's going to be a pretty rough ride if you try to close uh, that far out of, uh, of, out of sync. However, there are certain situations that you may have to do just that to restore an electrical system. All right, here's a question for you. When is 25 equal to 27? And I, I always get a good chuckle out of, of this question. Uh, 25 being, again, a sync check relay in the ANSI numbering scheme. And a 27 is an under voltage relay. And there are, all, um, particularly, not so much popular now, but um, back you know, before microprocessor relays became popular, there was a, a, a type of standalone sync check relay. And it was just basically a little, little box. And in reality, it really wasn't looking at phase angle. It was actually looking at voltage. And what you would have is, in effect, think of this, the, the uh, diameter, or excuse me, the radius of that circle as being one per unit voltage. If your 
line voltage was within this area, then it would, it would allow you to close. Because what that relay really was, was not, didn't have anything to do with looking at actual phase angles. It's simply looking at the voltage difference between the two relays, or excuse me, between the two uh, voltage sources. And if that voltage was below a certain amount, and again, easily calculated, then uh, it would, the, the, the relay would pick up change states and allow you to close. All right, one of the key points, and I alluded to it earlier with this contact, say we close our control switch and we leave it closed. So we've got a standing close and we were energizing a, a, a otherwise dead transmission line, so we had hot bus, dead line. Now, what if the sync check relay momentarily drops out when it transitions from hot bus deadline to hot line hot bus and looking at the phase angle. Now that sounds somewhat unlikely, however, um, back about 15 years ago, one of the popular uh, relay manufacturers actually had this very bug in one of their relays and under proper conditions when you had a standing close it would actually allow the breaker to cycle. And uh, uh, it was a problem that was rather embarrassing for them. It was discovered and uh, quickly remedied. But again, it's just one of those fine details that you want to uh, keep your eye on and, and be aware of. Uh, and again, situational awareness when we're doing designs is a critical, uh, a critical function of what we do. And now I, I want to continue our, our review. And this time, just look at, at our trip logic. Our trip coil, trip coil one, is located right here. And then over here, all of this is for trip coil two. And again, uh, the, the right up in this uh, area here and right over here is the uh, low gas uh, trip function in this breaker. Now then, I also want to introduce the concept to you of trip coil monitoring. In this scheme, I've, I've shown our closed circuit over here, but I also have, have uh, shown our trip circuit, and uh, you can see that where I've drawn this into trip coil one, <clears throat> that 86 relay, this contact, would adequately trip that circuit breaker. <clears throat> but notice I've put in parallel with our trip contacts, a red light. The red light has enough resistance to it that it's not going to allow enough current to go through the trip coil to trip the breaker. However, it will be illuminated. And it will only, but, but that will only happen if the breaker is closed and you have continuity through this circuit to the trip coil. And this is a, a, a kind of an old fashioned way that uh, people will, and you still see this a lot in substations, this is how people will monitor the health of the trip circuit. If, if the breaker is closed and the red light is not on, you cannot rely on that, uh, on that trip circuit to function as necessary when called upon uh, to clear a fault. Now then, on the other hand, the light bulb may be burned out as well. But uh, anyway, this is, it would be a, a, a good indication as to the health of the circuit breaker. Now, the problem with this is, if no one is there that day, and you have a problem and your red light isn't on, the red light can't tell anyone. And so, with the uh, development of modern relays, where we can put an opto-isolated input into a relay, we can actually get rid of this red light and just treat this as an input to our relay, and we can achieve the same thing. And the relay talks to SCADA. So now you're going to have some positive indication remotely that you have a problem with your circuit breaker and that will give you the opportunity to do something about it. Furthermore, you can actually rig up a scheme like this to provide monitoring of your closed circuit and very easily you can uh, also put it on your second uh, trip coil. <clears throat> Another example relay and the one I want to talk about today 
is called a, a latching relay, often simply called a latch uh, in a comparable uh, uh, function within programmed logic is often referred to a flip as a flip-flop. What you have here, if you look at my diagram right up here, this is actually would function as a latching relay. If you close X, pick up Y, its contacts will change state and then seal in when you close that and then you would reset it by pushing that push button Z. Now there's some downsides to this. You can probably operate uh, your little X uh, uh, contact remotely but certainly in this case you wouldn't be able to do that remotely. Plus you have the problem that to do this once you've um, set your latch it's going to be continuously uh, energized. And that's not always a good feature to have in, uh, you know, in our designs. So actually what you'll see more commonly in a latching relay is, is how I've depicted it here. Where you're going to have two different uh, relays or functions that are controlling the latching relay. And you're going to have an operate and a reset uh, coil and then typical form C contact over to the side. Now the question I have for you on this is what is the de-energized state of a latching relay? Well, it's really not defined. And um, what I often would do back in the day when I was uh, uh, doing these designs, I'd put a small note underneath, the, uh, underneath my uh, uh, contact display that states contact shown uh, in, in the state after the reset coil was last energized. And so that removes any confusion on this. I've got an example right here in my hand of a commonly used latching relay. This is called a latching switch relay. It's by a company called ElectroSwitch and they make some really good handy stuff for this sort of thing. And this one is a latching relay in that it can be controlled remotely and I'll operate it remotely through the SCADA system. But notice it also has a handle on it. And so that you can, uh, I had it upside down, so that you can operate the thing in, if you're uh, in the substation. Very handy for maintenance uh, purposes because the maintain maintenance folks and relay technicians like to be able to do this. In fact, what you may want to do is once it's in the manual position, wire one of its uh, contacts that would be open in, the, in this position to open up uh, your SCADA circuit so that uh, once it's in that position locally, it can't be reset remotely. Anyway, just an idea. And again, this is something you'd want to coordinate uh, with uh, local standards on uh, from your client. Anyhow, this is a, a latching switch relay. Very handy device uh, for this sort of, uh, these sorts of relay schemes. All right, this uh, actually concludes class number three. And in this class, we've continued our study of DC schematics uh, uh, for typical circuit breakers. Um, in this class, we introduced, after doing a bit of a review, we introduced the 86 and the uh, 25 functions and, and described how they're used in a, a circuit breaker control. Uh, we also uh, introduced strip coil monitoring and the 52X schemes and then reviewed our charging circuits, uh, heaters, and then we introduced the latching relay. Next week we are going to study our next uh, class. We will study uh, breaker failure schemes for relays, or excuse me, for, um, for uh, circuit breakers. And the idea of these things, to kind of give you a preview of it, is circuit breakers are very important, obviously, in uh, uh, the way the power grid operates and how we protect it from faults. So much so that if a breaker fails to operate, uh, we have to be able to back it up because failure to clear a fault would be a dramatically bad thing and even for a very short, what to us would be a very short duration of even less than one second, that can be enough to cause uh, voltages to collapse and a regional outage to ensue. Uh, look forward to seeing you in the next class. Thank you.